Hey, DerbyCon! How are you guys? Woo! Okay, guys, let's get the show started. Um, so the presentation today is going to be Operating in the Shadows. And my name is Carlos Perez. So a bit about myself. Uh, my day job is as a director of reverse engineering and integration for a security vendor. Uh, yes, I know I'm a manager and you're going like, what the fuck is he doing up there talking? Uh, but in my spare time, I still do some research and I still write some tools and talk with very smart people. And I kind of get all of that information into my head. I'm one of the co-hosts in the Security Weekly podcast. So you, some of you probably may have heard it. Uh, also, I blog from time to time in uh, darkoperator.com. In addition to that, I'm a contributor to many open source tools out there. Uh, PowerShell, Python, Ruby. Uh, I've written several Metasploit modules, Metaverse scripts. Um, and I, I, I kind of keep just jumping around. You can see that, uh, that about my ADHD as I move from one language to the other. Uh, recently, I've been focusing on PowerShell, which is great. Um, so, on the talk today, why do we want to operate in the shadows? Uh, this was a talk that I have been having with several people since yesterday. It's very simple. Um, and, and just to be clear, I know that many of you have asked me this question uh, as I was talking with you in the hall, and uh, the question was, what the fuck? Right now, when you talk with blue teams out there, they're going like, they're not catching me. Why do I need to operate on, in the shadows? Why do I need to be under the radar? Well, stuff has been changing a bit. Not much, but a bit. Uh, when we look at stuff, uh, there have been some tools out there, information, training, and stuff, where blue teams have been getting better. I've had the chance to actually uh, talk with some of these blue teams in one of them is a very big company in the uh, West Coast. I've actually talked to two of their internal blue teams. I've actually had the pleasure of helping a, a bunch of friends in a pen test that they were doing to a military industrial company out on the East Coast. And one of the things that we noticed was that we were getting caught seconds in. We went in, we started kind of trying to uh, see what, what we had on the system. We were following those rules. We're going to live off the land. We're going to be kind of like uh, survivalist ninjas here. We're going to use Windows tools so they won't be able to detect us. Five seconds later, we lost our shell. Later, we got into another system, and all of a sudden, everything was hokey-dory until we created another shell, and then we added some persistent. Boom, five minutes later, we lost our shell. And we just kept moving and moving the network, and we just keep getting caught. And it was because this blue team actually knew their shit, which, which actually just floored us completely. Anything we did, they were looking at their event logs and they were triggering on it. Then when I had a chance to go to an event in the, in the West Coast and I was able to meet some people in a very big blue team, they were telling me, yeah, we're able to do that. And it actually kind of surprised me. They really got that mantra of operating with the assumed uh, compromise. And when I was talking with one of them, uh, he's a great friend of mine, his name is Dave, and I was talking, how do you guys operate typically? It says, well, blue team, we're hunting. We've gotten to the maturity level where we're not no longer fighting fires. We're hunters. So since we're assuming that we have been compromised, we're always hunting for the red team. And then we have several meetings in a couple of weeks with the red team where they come in and we say, dude, we catch you here. And they'll go, no, you didn't. I was over here. And then we take those rules. We apply, we apply the IOCs that they give us and we work with them. So yeah, actually, I actually have some hope. I'm not so bitter anymore when I'm talking about security with several people because stuff is actually... Um, Improving. And then as I was talking with John Strand, talking with other of my friends, and as you see uh, in the uh, panel that we had this morning, in fact, I, I was actually in shock because for the first 30 minutes, they were talking a lot of stuff that I was going like, I'm going to talk about that in my talk. Don't, don't talk about it yet. And they were talking about what, the main reason for why. Because we pen testers, we help blue team test their controls. 
if we're a pen tester and we call ourselves professionals, and this is our profession, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that we're QA, like Chris Nickerson said. We're going in, they have their controls, they have monitor and stuff. We go in and we try to break their shit and tell them, hey, it broke here because you were not looking at what you needed to be looking at. You need to tune this this way. And then you talk with Rafael Much that came out with uh, Cabal Strike 3.0. And one of the nice things he actually added to Cabal Strike was that now you can get a report of IOCs of all of your actions. So that actually helps you when you go to the blue team and you go like, hey guys, here are all my IOCs. Which ones of these did you miss and which ones did you caught? Let me help you improve on that. And many times people go like, well, why do I want to do that? I like my cushy job. I'm like, dude, you don't work in government. You're a hacker. Your job is just to challenge yourself. So typically we, have, we go through a process when we go into a pen test. One of them is identifying under what privilege we're actually running because we need to know who we are in that network. And many times just being a regular user can have its advantage and we don't have to go after domain admin. If all of a sudden the guy who clicked on my phishing scheme was the CFO, game over, man. I'm accessing all of your information that affects your business. That is just enough for me to show uh, risk to your uh, infrastructure. So typically we just do that. We check what is our privilege. Then we just go and try to identify the controls. Um, for those of you who are in the military, I have a lot of friends whose job is to put holes in two-legged animals. And the way that they work is that they were telling me, typically when we infiltrate or we go in, one of the first things we do is we just stay quiet and listen. I'm like, why? He says, well, we need to know if we hear somebody shooting in the air and saying that we are in certain that area, or when we go into an urban area and we're operating, we just go in, sit, watch, and listen. We're looking for the controls of the opponent. What, who are, is looking for us, what controls do they have, what types of door, concertina wire, cameras, alarms, all of that kind of stuff. They're looking for controls. Same thing when we go into a network. We go into that box, we need to know what shit is there so we won't trigger it. We also need to identify, are those controls monitored? There's no use for you to lock everything if nobody's looking at the logs. All of us have had that frustration reading the Verizon report, reading the Cisco report, reading the Microsoft report, and all of them are saying the same shit. 240 days or more for somebody to actually know that they have been compromised. And we're going, like, why do I bother working in this, in this industry until you find those nuggets of information, or those nuggets of clients out there that actually go like, yeah, we get it, we're working to change this. And then all of a sudden, a couple of months later, you find another one. And then you find another customer that you took the time to work with them and work with their blue team, and they're actually improving. And that kind of makes you feel good inside. And that's why, uh, typically, if you have heard my other presentations in years before, I'm very negative. I'm bitter, uh, sometimes even bitter when I talk about blue teams. And now my perspective has been changing because of this. So another thing is, um, when they're monitoring, are they moving those logs outside their box? That will give me some information. So as I mentioned, typically we go with situational awareness. We go in, we want to know where we are, how are we going to be, uh, um, how is that target set up? How are we going to operate in it? So we start first looking into that host. We got into the host, we'll look what controls they have on that host. And then once we feel secure, we feel safe, we then start moving laterally in that network. Now, our behavior will be dictated by those controls. So, if the customer actually has a blindfold, he's already in the shadows. I can just walk up to him and slap him, and he won't know who did it. He's in the shadows. But if my opponent actually has his eyes open, I, I cannot approach him directly. That will limit my tool set. It will limit my actions. It will limit my angles of attack on that host. So Ernest Hemingway has a very nice uh, quote that says, certainly there's no hunting like hunting of men. And those who have hunted our men long enough 
and liked it, never really cared for anything else thereafter. It is the same thing when you're a pen tester. If you're going in and you have a bunch of scripts that are always getting you shell, you're there's going to get a time that you're going to get bored with it. And all of a sudden, you find a blue team that actually knows their stuff, and you're getting caught. All of a sudden, you go like, oh, cool, this is a challenge. You get, all, you get those brain juices flowing in your head, and you're going like, cool, finally, a one-on-one, -on -one, somebody who can actually kind of test me, move me to the limits. And that's how we, how we should start working. We should start going out there. And as we're doing our pen tests and stuff, we teach blue team, blue teams gets better. We get, we now have to adapt. We now need to get better. They get better and we just keep getting better and we just keep playing chess and playing those nice games with one another. We got to reach that point so we get more excited. So typically, as I mentioned, we go with privilege. Privilege allows us to determine what we can actually enumerate in that box, and what tools am I going to use to enumerate this stuff uh, on it. After that, also, uh, privilege is also, uh, also uh, indicates initial behavior. If all of a sudden I go into a box, and that box, they're domain admin, and they're a user that click on something, that's already telling me that they have very bad behavior inside of their network, that they really have very bad practices. If all of a sudden I get into that box and that user is local admin on his box and this is the secretary who I just pwned and she's local admin on her box, doesn't look that good. So privilege will actually dictate that. And as I mentioned, uh, regular user accounts may be all that we need, but we need to actually look for that information ahead of time. Um, uh, I remember my dad told me uh, when he was at Fort Benning, Georgia, he told me uh, that there was this big sign that had the Murphy's Laws of Combat in it every time he went to the uh, mess hall. This was back in the Vietnam era. And one of them actually said, professionals are predictable, but the world's full of amateurs. Right now, if you're a, a professional, you have certain rules or SOPs, standard operating procedures that you're going to follow always. You're going to follow the P-test, the Penetration Testing Execution Standard. You're going to use shells that encrypt your customer data. You're going to have certain behaviors are going to be unique. But many times, as, as uh, John mentioned, his favorite quote is that uh, there are a lot of pen testers out there that are, come from the pen testing puppy mills. In my case, I call them tool monkeys that are people that they know MMAP, they know Metasploit, you take them away, and they just go bunkers. They don't know what to do. So uh, we have to kind of strive to move away and be that unique group inside of a larger group, and we should be those professionals. Uh, I borrowed this slide from uh, my very good friend, Lee Holmes. It is the Maslow hierarchy of security controls. The Maslow hierarchy tells that you need certain things in life, like food, water, uh, rest, and some other stuff. And here we're just applying that to security controls. So I, I, I like that concept and I borrowed, him, I borrowed it from him. So when we're looking at controls, typically the first one that we're going to find in an environment is AV, followed by probably whitelisting, blacklisting type of applications and controls of, on them. It doesn't need to be app locker. It could actually be something as simple as proper echoes on files and then auditing. After that, we just keep moving up and we move to probably something like device guard in Windows 10 that we'll probably see in the future deployed. We just keep moving up, and now we have an, an opponent who not only just decided to deploy um, antivirus and start locking down a bit their system, but now they're auditing. They're proactively enabling auditing on their boxes to look for something more. And then they just keep moving up, and we go moving up to forensic capture of host-based artifacts. All of a sudden, they're capturing information and filtering all of that auditing information and looking for those indicators of compromise. And then we move to the holy grail, which is where we, you have an actual team that will be able to do memory forensics, because we all know that if we live in memory, many times we just can go completely unnoticed. There are very few organizations that can actually do that. Uh, I can actually count them, the ones that I know, with my left hand. And the guys in Paul.com call me Charlie Four Fingers because I have four fingers. So that will give you an idea how small that uh, 
that number of people are. One of them is Microsoft, Google, and there are uh, and there's another one that I know. That actually, certain teams inside of those organizations, when they see something funny and that something funny they're seeing doesn't make them laugh, they will actually dump the memory of that box remotely, bring it over to start analysis. And we're seeing people actually move into this. They're starting with that hunting mentality. But they're few and far between, and we have to work with them to make that number even bigger. So when we start looking at the controls, and we'll start looking, um, in fact, I'm not going to bore you with these tables and go one by one by one by one. I don't want to have you guys here for uh, two hours. So typically antivirus, we all know antivirus. We know it's there. Almost, all, in fact, let me skip this to just go. Um, we typically say, antivirus is dead. It's not doing anything. Then again, what I get the most in IRC and via email from people is, how do I bypass AVG? How do I bypass Symantec? And I would say for every 10 emails or questions that I get from people, eight are still related about antivirus. So if we're saying that it's dead, why do we find it so annoying? That is one of those cases where we have to bring our game up. Because if you talk with a mid-level pen tester, a high-level pen tester, with experience one, one of those Sith Lords of Jedi's, depending on which band you want to be, um, you're going to notice that it's going like, nah, I can bypass any AV. I already have that knowledge. I have that experience. I know how to do it. I know how I have my own lab where I can test my tools, do my stuff, and do it. But still, out there, uh, the majority of, of people that we're finding out there are still being caught by AV. So AV actually does serve a purpose. AV can actually be useful here. Um, one advantage is that we it is easily to detect and easily for us to actually bypass. There are many techniques, many tools over there to bypass AV. We have cryptors, we have packers, we can repackage in, inside of scripting languages. We can use PowerShell, we can compile them in Go. We can just alter that fingerprint in so many ways. If not, um, uh, one of my favorite tools is the Bail framework. You can just grab up almost about anything, pack it in Python, and you'll notice that it bypasses. In fact, in fact if you want to see examples on how to bypass almost all AVs, just go to the Black Hills security booth. They actually have a series of videos where they go one by one on the top antivirus vendors out there, and they're showing techniques right there, right next door in their booth on how to bypass each one. Yes, I know they're trolling Symantec by putting a big sign, how to bypass Symantec in front of, in front of their booth. But yeah, they do know their stuff. Um, so typically when we go in and we look in the case of Windows, most of the antivirus solutions out there actually uh, go into a deal with Microsoft when they get access to specific APIs that are under NDA. And what they do is they register their antivirus product on their uh, security center uh, in, in, in Windows. When you go and you open Windows and you get that pop-up box that says your antivirus has been disabled because, let's face it, almost all of us all of a sudden, we're in a crunch, it's 2 a.m., we're trying to deal something with Metasploit or something with Cobalt Strike. We decided to export our payload and then we copy it to the Windows machine and boom, Windows Defender catches it and we're like, oh, crap. And you go in and you disable it so you can finish your test and go to sleep. And all of a sudden, you see that Windows pops up a box that says, hey, your antivirus solution is disabled. That is Security Center. So most of the ABs actually register there. Um, very few firewalls, uh, very few others actually register with it, and they can. Uh, one of the best ways to actually enumerate this is via WMI. WMI is an awesome tool, for, both for the defender and the attacker. If you want to just be blown away of all the things you can do with WMI, just go to Matt Graber's talk here at DerbyCon, and, 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 yay, and you're going to have a, a great time there and learn a lot. So when we look at WMI and SIM, uh, in Windows Vista 2008, it's going to be registered under Security Center 2. In the case of XP and 2003, they should be ashamed and they should be flogged. Uh, then it's going to be under Root Security Center. I know, I know, there are, there are business reasons, budgetary reasons, that probably they're running still, Windows 2003. 
but I still go into environments when I find NT4 and 2000, and that's when I start getting bitter. Um, so when we go there, uh, typically what they'll do is that uh, there are several products that can be registered there. So we have several classes that we can actually query. One of them is just simply antivirus, and we get all of the antivirus products registered in that box. You can have three different antivirus products, like my dad one time did. Somehow he felt he would be more secure, so he went to Night Night, and he just selected every antivirus product that was there in Night Night, downloaded that single install, installed them all, and then he's calling me like, hey, Carly, that's my nickname. Hey, hey Carly, what's happening here? My machine's running super slow. And I'm like, uh... You did anything, Dad. Well, do you know that website that you showed me so I can uh, install stuff quickly? Yes. Well, I download all the antivirus and download them because in CNN they were talking about that there's going to be a, a, a awakening of people because everybody's getting attacked and information's getting stolen and blah, 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 and a lot of people are getting sued. There are suicides. And I'm like, yeah, that's the Ashley Madison story, Dad. You're not there. I checked. And... Um, <laughs> um, and he, he, he put all of the antivirus products inside of the box, and he was getting nervous. And going, don't, don't worry, um, let's start disabling those. So, if, and when you go into the WMI key, you can actually list them all. So typically, the query would look like this. Here um, is, is an example of a module I wrote in Metasploit. It only took me less than five minutes to write. It's very simple. Uh, Metasploit actually lets me do WMI queries on the box, which is awesome. Uh, thanks, OJ. Please do finish fixing it. Um, so, in this case, I just have a case statement where I have, if I want to query for AV, spyware, firewall, or just all of them. And here's an example of that module uh, running. Let's see if the, uh, did the video launch over there? Yeah? Okay. I have not seen it over here. So, there you will see a kind of an example of it running, and it, it should enumerate two different uh, antivirus products are in that box. And one of the things I like about uh, the WMI class is that when you get that data, there's going to be a specific field in it, which is a kind of a small byte array, that when you go into it, um, the six byte going from left to right, when you look at it, you'll be able to tell if the product is enabled or disabled. So Microsoft is nice enough to give us that information. Uh, different products will actually tell you if they're um, if they're up to date, not up to date, and will give you a, a bit more information via those classes. In addition to that, typically, so now we know that they have an antivirus product. We know which type of antivirus product. So now we can start grabbing our stuff that we're going to be using for persistence, or the tools that we're going to use, and we're going to test them for them. But before we do that, one of the things I have found in many engagements is that they tend to set exclusions. And here's another module. In this case, I wrote it specifically for Windows Defender that goes in into one of my lab boxes and goes and identifies, hey, this Windows Defender has exclusions. And it will actually show that one of them is a, uh, a share in the network when I tend to put off most of my payloads and stuff that I'm testing on, and also another one in the desktop, which is test underscore code, when I just put raw stuff in it. So this is quite helpful for me to kind of detect uh, how the control is actually implemented. We're starting to look at the controls. We're starting to look at how the control is being configured, and we're trying to see how can we abuse that configuration. Did it finish? All right. Cool. So, as I mentioned, we start looking at the controls many times. Um, level of controls, when we start looking at them, they will be a good indicator of the level of maturity of that organization. We're trying to get that data. It is like you all of a sudden go into a fight in the street, and the punk goes like this, hey, what's the problem? You already have an idea that the guy's going to get his teeth uh, punched in if it's going like this to you. All of a sudden, you see that the guy squares up, just like a boxer, you can like, oh, oh, shit. Just by looking at the posture of those controls, you're going to know in what position you are. Um, and just to remember, even the simplest control can give us away. So this is why we typically try to have repeatable, testable SOPs 
standard operating procedures so we can minimize that risk. So one of the first things I like to do is enumerating the audit policy. I like to know what they're actually auditing on the box. Now, there are several ways that you can actually do this. Uh, one of them is using auditpol.exe, which is a tool inside of the box. Sadly, my experience with that web, uh, East Coast company was as soon as we ran it, we got caught. Why? Well, they're very smart. They have a bunch of admin tools that people run on the boxes, or they run when they're trying to fix boxes and stuff. And they set up in their sim windows for maintenance. And anytime any of those tools are ran outside of one of those windows, they just put out a red alert for the security team to check. So if I hit NSA, uh, NetSH, IPconfig, PowerShell, Windows scripting host, CS script, or anything like that outside of that window, they're going to go like, uh-oh, somebody, somebody's doing something they shouldn't do. And they quickly check the system. Did somebody open a ticket for that host? Yes or no? No. OK, dump memory, check connections. Let's see what's going on there. Because they, decide they have a very solid change management policy where they know that nothing should happen on those boxes unless it is this day of the week or during this specific hours we, where we have set up this. And I find it very interesting because uh, how many here have read the book, The Phoenix Project? Like six or seven. OK, highly, highly recommended. But do be warned, as you're reading that novel, you will have flashbacks. So depending on the company that you have worked for and your experience in life, you, and if you have IT PTSD, it may bring it out. Be warned. It is a very good novel where the, the guy just comes in, he's going in, he's looking at stuff, and one of the first things he needs to change is change management. Why? Because all of a sudden, the day that they have to put out the uh, payroll, everything crashes and everybody's going, it's your fault. Going like that. And one of the things you have to change. So if we can see that type of behavior, if we can see that type of organization in the target, for example, we go in, we dump emails, and we see emails that says, change management, we got to go, huh, I should copy that email and read it. Typically, we just go password, secret, sex, and we look through those when we're looking through the emails. Uh, so one of the things I tend to do for the uh, audit API is that I, I use the uh, NetSec AP header uh, from the um, Advanced API 32 library, and I just write a small C++ program. Yes, I know, C++ sucks. I should have done it in C, but I'm not that lead. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I can just see Matt Graber just coughing like, C++. You do it in C, do it in assembly. Come on, challenge yourself. <laughs> I'm just rolling your butt. Um, so yeah, here's a small sample where you can see I'm loading those libraries and I'm using certain calls. One of the things typically I do is I enumerate each category, then I enumerate all of the subcategories and then I go to each of those subcategories and I try to identify what's going on there. And you go like, Carlos, why don't you run audit poll? Because I can get caught. I need to know if process, processes are being audited on that box. So only by me being able to run an exploit and getting a shell on that box, preferably Meterpreter or Beacon or something like that that is member uh, resident in memory, I may have already given myself away. I don't want to make more noise on that box that may get me caught. Because probably it was an HTA attack, a macro attack that probably dropped something on disk. And or they had Sysmon. And as I was injecting into memory, Sysmon says, hey, the, uh, somebody created a remote thread. Look at this. So I, I may have given myself away. So I don't want to make more noise on that target. So one of the things I do, in my case, here's an example of my interpreter. I use execute, hidden, channelize, interactive, in memory. I give it a, a dummy file, and this guy, in this case, is going to be notepad.exe. Come on, who monitors for notepad.exe in their network? Almost nobody. So, and then I just give it my exe, which is get audit poll. It runs, 
and it gives me all of the information of what is actually being audited, if it is for success or failure, and I'm getting all of that info, and it's running in memory. So if I see process auditing being monitored, one of the first things that I'm going to check then is for a specific registry key. That specific registry key is uh, under HQ Local Machine Software Microsoft Windows Current Version Policies System Audit, and it's going to be called Process Creation Include Command Line. If you have ever had the displeasure of working with the event locks in Windows for process auditing, they only kind of, they like to tease. They like to say, hey, something wrong happened here, and that's all. You see the process that was created. You get a pit. Oh, and by the way, we're going to give it to you in hex format. And you're like, come on. And they kind of limit the information is a bit limited. So you only know when it ran under one account and when. And other information in there that you may find useful, you actually have to hammer it out, out of that event lock. So it takes a bit of processing. Now, they did improve it a bit. Uh, recently this year, the, there's the KB uh, 34375 that you can install in Windows 7 or and 2008 R, uh, R2. It is also already uh, included with Windows 10, Windows 8, 8.1, uh, Windows 2012, 2012 R2. That actually lets me get that command line. How many here were in the presentation that Lee Holmes did today about PowerShell? Cool. Oh. Wow, almost everybody. Awesome. So everybody saw when Lee was doing his example about the encoded command, you, see, you saw dash encoded command. And you saw all of everything that he was running in that command line. I'm not even going to ask who was in Pyrotech's uh, presentation because this has to be almost everybody. And he also covered several techniques that when you look at those, you're going to find them in the process auditing log. You're going to see there, but you're only going to see an exe. I can rename Mimikatz to whatever I want. And all of a sudden you see SVC host. And I can run it from a folder that probably may confuse the user that's looking at it. And he may, know, may not know about it. But when you start looking at the full command line, then you start getting more details. And then you start moving to higher versions of Windows, like Windows 2012. When you do this, it will enable also the full command line for the parent process. So all of a sudden, I have the parent process full command line and the child process full command line. And I'm able to kind of see what's actually going on, which is kind of awesome. Now, as I mentioned, it kind of lacks some of the information. Um, you can fill the gap with commercial products. You can use Tenable Log Correlation Engine. Yes, I had to include it first. Um, there's also Microsoft Sysmon. I really love Sysmon with the only exception that Mark Rusinovich keeps changing the schema of the, of, of the rules and the documentations a couple of weeks later, which kind of breaks a bunch of my stuff. But other than that, it's awesome. Are you still blocking Chris on Twitter? Mark, I love you. Don't block me. Um, then you have uh, Bit9 Carbon Black. I know that everybody kind of rips on them. I've actually seen shells running out of cb.exe and stuff like that. Uh, but it's good. It, it is like Sysmon with a super uber nice GUI. So if you don't have the budget, try to go with Sysmon. It tends to be awesome. So here we have an example of a Sysmon entry. When we look at it, one of the first things that we're going to notice is we're getting that full command line. That's the, that is an example of a power of a interpreter payload that I actually exported as uh, in PowerShell that is running there. Um, actually was so big that it had to be compressed. So you, the first command that you're seeing is just that payload running in a compressed mode. And then that is invoking, again, PowerShell to then run the uh, unencoded code, the compressed code. So then you see um, what actually ran there. In addition to that, you can see the integrity level. It ran as a high integrity level. So that's giving me information under what privileges it was running. Then one of the things I'm seeing is that they're hashing that file. So then they, if they decide that that's something dangerous, they can take the hash of that process and start looking to their network. This is scary if you're a red team. This means my tools can be tracked a lot easier. 
This means they can track my movements inside of the network. Not only that, but it will also start monitoring your uh, network connections for those files. So typically what people will do is they'll set up a rule for Sysmon that says ignore Internet Explorer, ignore Fire, Fire, um, Firefox, Chrome, ignore the Windows Update service, any other network connection that you, or any other pro, or the IM client for Java, HipChat, and that, or, and then any other connection out there that gets created, log it. I want to see it and ship it to me. It does that every 15 seconds, so you have a 15 second window before that gets reported. Same for UDP calls. And then if you want to be even more scared, uh, one of the things that actually Sysmon can do is that as I'm migrating from one process to the other, or I'm injecting a payload into another process, when you're doing that, you're, you, uh, they have a list of calls that they typically check that malware uses, and it will do a, remote, a create remote threat and they'll detect that and tell you from what process to what process was that done. In this case, it caught me migrating from PowerShell to Notepad.exe. So we have to be careful. Now they have this ability to know as we're even moving inside of memory. Um, oh, oh, by the way, the only process in Windows that does this by default it is WMI. So the only thing you have to do is just go under that process and then you can do all of the injections you want. And if the rules are kind of lax, you'll bypass those for detection. It is the only process I know in a Windows box that creates remote threats by default on a regular box in the network. So here I have an example of detecting Sysmon. It is running against a Windows 2010 host, I'll be able to see what is it actually logging, if it is logging network connections, if it is logging, um, if it is hashing. It will tell me if there are rules or not. One of the advantages of Sysmo is I can create rules. So what information can I gain about this is also the material level, because probably they de deployed Sysmon, but if I don't see rules, that means they're still in diapers. They're still playing with it. They're not leveraging the tool to the, the extreme. So I won't get that scared if I see it. If I don't see rules and I don't see some other stuff enabled, I just gauge their maturity level. I'm kind of guessing where they are in terms of operation. Did it finish running? Still running? Okay. Like, let me change my settings here for the screen. Uh, yeah. Um, you can actually use Internet Explorer com object. The thing is that uh, many times what we're trying to do is kind of minimize the amount of noise that we have to deal with. Um, so yeah, many times I, I just tell customers, you're starting up and you're, con you're not that good at managing logs. Don't enable on all of your uh, client machines log into an explorer because you're just going to get pummeled with logs. Same for Firefox, same for Chrome. Now on your servers, it's a different story. On your servers, if you catch somebody using an internet explorer on a server, you should go and slap him. Same for Firefox or Chrome. In some organizations, that may be a GRE, a resume generating event. So we have to be careful on those. Uh, I think it's running. OK. Cool. Now we're moving over to uh, whitelisting and blacklisting. Rarely implemented domain wide. I still haven't seen one single organization that has deployed AppLocker domain wide. It is difficult to manage. It's not the easiest tool out there, I have to admit. Um, it's mostly used for uh, systems that are actually, let's say, your receptionist systems are, are 
accessible to other people, POS. In the case of Target, probably they should have used it in the, um, what was it, the, uh, 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 with the cut meat, uh, yeah, in the butcher area where they infected the machine that they moved to the POS. They should have used that. Um, you can actually use it in audit mode and you can get a bunch of information. It, is a ver it's a, it's, it can be used as a poor man's login system and it works awesome. If you want to learn a bunch of techniques about bypassing uh, whitelisting, uh, sub three I, is, I think is the, well, sub T is one of those guys that I, uh, he's, I don't know if he's new in the community or not, but one of the things I noticed is that he's good. He takes it as a personal challenge to bypass whitelisting products or blacklisting products out there. It's really good, so I real, highly recommend his blog post, also his um, GitHub. Device guard is a great improvement. It's a lot easier to configure, a lot easier to deploy, a lot easier to manage, but it's still starting out. We'll have to wait and see how many people actually deploy Windows 10. There are over 75 million of, there, uh, of them out there, probably not many in, the, in, in enterprises, but it's out there. Uh, and there are some bypasses that even SIPT has already found that Microsoft is already working on fixes on those. Here's an example on AppLocker. When I just go and enumerate AppLocker, yeah, let me move it a bit here. Oh. Oh. So I'm using a module called Enum AppLocker. All of these modules, you can find them in my GitHub, on the uh, github.com doc operator. There's under the repo, uh, my interpreter scripts. I know it's all, uh, almost everybody's using post modules now. So here you can see I set a session, I run it. I'm running against my target box. It goes into registry, pulls all of the, uh, each one of the different rules that are in XML format in the registry, parses that XML. As I'm going in, all of a sudden I see, hey, PowerShell, Huh, allows PowerShell from a specific location. So that means if I'm going to do anything with PowerShell, I better do it from that location. I set to allow. Hmm, cool. Anyone on the rule. So that it's already giving me information of who can actually run it or not. I can actually check if it is enforced or if it is set up to audit. Also in the rules. Here you can see that says script enable. So the rule is actually being forced. On MSI packets, there are no rules. It's actually disabled. So that means I can probably use MSI as one of my uh, back doors on that box for persistence. I can set up fake MSIs and they make sure uh, a technique that I, I don't know if it is public or a lot of people are actually using it. It's that they'll put uh, an MSI on the box that is backdoored and then they'll go via WMI and run Win32 underscore product when you query that uh, WMI class, it would actually force the system to rebuild all of the MSIs and then they get back uh, their control in the box. If not, I apologize to my friend for telling his technique. Um, sorry, dude. Also here you can see DLLs are enabled. They're in audit mode. So as DLLs are being loaded or being ran, they're being audited on that box and they can pull that information. So right now I just got a bunch of information how they have that box set up. Now I know how to behave in that box. So I just went from antivirus, I went over to how they're logging stuff, and now I, I look at their controls. Now I know how I can behave inside of that environment. Now, not yet, because we just look at Windows, but we haven't looked at other stuff. Those of you who were at Lee Holmes' presentation today, you notice that. PowerShell has a lot of login in it now. It can actually take a bunch of, detect a bunch of stuff, especially if you're running Windows 2012 and, or Windows 8.1 or above with uh, PowerShell version 4 and update 1 applied to it. You have all of those niceties that you saw, almost all of them that you saw for uh, PowerShell 5. Now you have them also on those systems, and I can start tracking you as you're doing stuff. Those of you who took my class, we covered how to also 
what you can actually log and see on previous versions of PowerShell, and, you, and it's quite a bit. So you can still be detected. So we still have to check for other stuff and enumerate that information, how that extra stuff is being logged. So here we have an example. Uh, it's not starting from where I tell it. I'm looking at my different sessions. None of them is my work laptop, I promise. Uh, I go use, post, windows, gather, and this is my own module, an UMPS env, and I'm running it in a box. I check the info on it. It's for enumerating PowerShell. Set my session like always. Let me skip ahead. Let me run it. It's running on the box. I see that it's running PowerShell version 5. Ooh, profile. That means I can backdoor that. Execution policy. Hmm, now I know if I have to bypass it or not. Because if you see that they're setting execution policy in the command line, probably they're looking at it, they might detect me. Also, I see, ooh, module logging. Shit. They can track modules that I'm loading. Oh, oh small tip. When you enable module logging and you launch PowerShell.exe, in the event logs, it will add the full command line of how you invoked the program that is running that run space. So you will get the full command line for PowerShell.exe, also the full command line for ISC or any other program that run that run space. That is kind of like a, a neat uh, addition when you enable module logging. You can see script block logging if it is enabled or not, transcripts and, and where the transcript are being moved if, if, it's, if it is in the network or locally. So that is, uh, that is kind of fun to kind of check. Um, then we start checking for centralized login. Are they centralizing all of their logs? Are they checking? Well, there are two different ways of doing this. One of them is pull, where somebody from the outside is going to my box and pulling those logs. Problem, they're limited on what they do. Typically, they use WMI. WMI will only give them the regular old event logs. They cannot get to the extended ones. Then there's the other method, what is pushing. They use agents or they use um, PowerShell forwarding. When you use PowerShell forwarding, actually you need to configure that in the box and we can actually enumerate that. So push is a lot better for us. Here we have an example on uh, enumerating event forwarding. I'm running it on the box. I set my session. I check, it will check for Windows event forwarding if it has been configured to push to a server and to what server and what are the settings for that. I run it, and it's pulling all of the information from the registry, and it's telling me, hey, you're connecting to a server. Uh, this is your server on this port. You're just using WSMAN. You're only connecting to one single server. This is another indicator of maturity. If they're sending their logs to two or three of those servers, I know that they really know their stuff. If they're sending it to one, uh, they're kind of starting off. Uh, also, I see the refresh rate. How often are they sending that info? So one of the other things that we have to do is that we have to control noise. Because one of the things that many of these people are looking for are patterns. And many times since they get a lot of false positives, they'll set boundaries on their patterns that if this is triggered five times, four times, three times, then trigger an alert. So we have to play that mind game with them. So we have to control our execution. Many times. Uh, I used to teach a class which was uh, automating Metasploit. And one of the things that you'll see students is that they have 20 shells, and they run the command against all 20 shells, and five of them were on a single host. And all of a sudden, you fell into that pattern. You were not checking for uniqueness. In this case, uh, have any of you used my pen test plugin for Metasploit framework? Okay. I see a couple of hands. It's a, a plugin that I wrote to kind of aid a pen tester with a bunch of additional tools for automating stuff. So one of the things I added to most of the post exploitation commands is for uniqueness. It will check the ID of that machine and it will then check the credentials and it will make sure that you don't hit that box twice under that credential when you're enumerating on your post exploitation actions. So that's a good way to control noise. Um, when it comes to determining your footprint, one of the things I tell people is build a lab, set up login properly, install Sysmon, uh, use the uh, cheat sheets from malware uh, archaeology on how to set login and auditing, 
set all of that stuff, see what footprint you're leaving there, and then just try to minimize it. And also start prepping the templates for when you're writing reports so you can tell your customers, this is my footprint. Also capture network traffic and then run that those PCAPs against other tools and get into the habit of giving that PCAP also to your customer for them to test and know. Um, so also, if you have the chance, install tools that look for these patterns that do the analysis. We have the Tenable Log Correlation Engine that actually does a great work there. We have Splunk, where you can write some additional hand tools, uh, hand uh, rules to detect this type of anomaly. And one of the recent additions out there, which is one of my favorites so far, is Microsoft Advanced Threats Analytics that will actually kind of, with time, builds what is normal behavior in your network. And if you do something that doesn't fit, it will trigger and it will alert. So remember, we're dealing with blue team. Let's play nice. Questions? No questions? Yes. Uh, double MI uh, for the persistence uh, with MSI. I'll have to check if I can share his code. Uh, it's somebody that told me I'm going to make this public sometime. I don't know where. I want to clean it up. And I sh uh, he showed it to me. I went like, oh, that's cool. Any other questions? If not, I wish you guys a good day and thanks. Thank you.